There is just one minute. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so sorry, there was an interruption, but I want to discuss uh, the quantum Zeno effect. And uh, in sort of semi colloquial language, it says the washed kettle never boils uh, in quantum mechanics. And so let me discuss, uh, you know, this particular question. And, Okay, so I will start by discussing the classical Zeno paradox, and then I will discuss the quantum Zeno effect. So the word, important word there is paradox. Paradox is, you know, you give some set of arguments and you arrive at a conclusion which sounds um, wrong. Okay, then you have to check if the arguments were wrong or if the conclusion which you thought was wrong was actually wrong. So, for example, I may make a statement that in quantum mechanics, a particle can go through both, um, uh, can be both particle and wave. This sounds like wrong. But then you have to appreciate somehow that you thought this was wrong, but actually this is allowed and this is quite okay. And, you know, so you have to rethink the way you think about problem when you encounter a paradox. So a paradox is very important to refine our ways of thinking. Okay, so in the Zeno paradox, we'll get to it is very soon, but it says that all motion is impossible. So the argument is actually wrong, but you have to figure out where the argument is wrong because the argument as it goes seems to be quite reasonable. But the quantum Zeno thing is actually an effect in the sense it's a physical effect, it actually happens. And so we will discuss this. And then I will try to explain to you how the quantum Zeno effect is a natural consequence of the postulates of quantum mechanics. So that's the quantum mechanics which we teach to all the students. You know, it is more than, it's almost a hundred years now. And all those things are well established and we have, people have been teaching them in, um, undergraduate classes and, you know, there are standard textbooks. And so the fact that there is quantum Zeno effect is not a great new revelation. And, uh, you know, you should be able to understand how it happens. Okay. After this, I will discuss something called super Zeno effect for which I will try to explain how the Zeno, quantum Zeno effect is used to preserve quantum states, which are important in quantum computation. And uh, then, uh, you know, then we uh, go to the next one. So let us start with the classical Zeno paradox. Zeno was a philosopher around 500 BC in Greece. And he argued that, uh, let us consider a race between Achilles and tortoise. And since the tortoise runs slower than Achilles, and so he's given some initial advantage. He starts a little bit ahead and then Achilles is this person behind. And uh, then Zeno tried to argue that he will show that, let us say the uh, tortoise runs as half the velocity speed of the Achilles. Then Achilles will never be able to catch up with the tortoise. Of course, that's kind of wrong. But anyway, let's go through the argument. The argument Achilles, this um, Zeno gave was that suppose the position of the Achilles is A and the tortoise is in a position T. So when the Achilles reaches the point T, which is now denoted by A prime, is the new position of A, the tortoise would have gone to some other further on position, which is called T prime. And then when Achilles reaches T prime, the tortoise has gone to some next further on position, T double prime. And when Achilles reaches the, this new position, which is called a triple prime here, then the tortoise has gone even further. And this keeps on going, right? It, it never stops. So he said that, so we conclude that you cannot, Achilles will never be able to catch up with the tortoise. So that is what he argued, that whenever Achilles reaches a point previously occupied by tortoise, the tortoise has gone further. And Achilles will never catch up. Now, Sir, this, and actually there are five or six Zeno paradoxes which are somewhat similar, 
and he argued that all motion is impossible. See, the point is Achilles, you know, sorry, Zeno perhaps realized that this was wrong, but he couldn't tell what was wrong with the argument. And in fact, I think for 2000 years, people couldn't really figure, they knew that this was wrong, of course, but they couldn't tell where the argument is wrong. Okay, so it took some time for people to realize where the argument goes bad. And it is a non-trivial issue because it involves understanding what is an infinite sequence, infinity and convergence of sequences. And that only happened around 1800 actually. And so that is sort of very rigorous, but okay, you can push it back by about 200 years to 1600. But before that, it took actually a long time for people to understand what was wrong with the argument. And let us summarize the error in one line here. It says the sequence a a double prime a, a prime a double prime etc. This is the positions of the Achilles, and there is a sequence t t prime t double prime, which are the positions of the tortoise. They are infinite sequences, but they tend to a finite limit. The fact that the sequence is infinite doesn't mean that the limit is also infinite. Okay, so and the finite limit is when they both become equal, a star equal to t star, and this limit is reached in a finite time. It takes infinite number of logical steps to get there, but it doesn't take infinite amount of actual physical time. Okay, so that is the summary of the argument. The error was one thing is infinite, so the other thing is also infinite, and uh, the number of steps to get to the point is infinite, but the actual thing occurs in finite time. So yeah, we understand and the Zeno problem is not a problem, actually the motion does occur and the Achilles will catch up with the tortoise. So now let us come to the quantum Zeno effect. Uh, sir, there is a request to zoom in a little. Uh, zoom more. Yes. Okay, is that better? Yes, sir. Okay, so the quantum Zeno effect is a simple consequence of the standard textbook formulation of quantum mechanics. So while I realize that I shouldn't put in too many formulas here, I have done sort of the minimum possible and I'm trying to explain without um, using too many um, formulas. Okay, but let us state the statement of the quantum Zeno effect, which is given here in five lines. Sorry, cannot, I tried to make it less and I couldn't do better. Okay, so it says that suppose you prepare a system in some way, it's a quantum mechanical system, it is in some quantum state. And then you make measurements of this system one after another after another at times in separated by amount delta. So you make measurements at times Tn equal to n delta, n is an integer, delta is some in small interval. And check each time if the system is in the same state as you started with. Okay, so you check at time delta whether it's in the same state, then you two delta it's in the same state, three delta in the same state. And then this is a quantum system. Sometimes with some probability it may change state and sometimes it may not change state. Okay, but you ask what is the probability that no change occurs up to time t. Okay, so there is some number which no, normally is less than one, but now I change delta. I change delta to a smaller value and then this probability changes because it depends on delta. That is not a big surprise because we said the measurement affects the quantum system in some way. But the surprising part is that if you let delta tend to zero, then this probability will tend to one. Whatever size zero, whatever state you are in, if you can watch it at very, very short intervals, then it will not change. In particular, if you can imagine something called continuous measurement, where you can measure every time it's there, you know, you are watching it continuously, then it will not evolve. This is the statement and this is the quantum Zeno effect. We are not thinking of continuous measurement, it is a limit of discrete measurements. Okay? Okay, so this result was realized and appreciated quite early in quantum mechanics. Uh, in, in von Neumann's book on quantum mechanics, you know, mathematical principles of quantum mechanics, so it's already there in 1932. And it is there in less than one page. He doesn't make a big deal of it. 
it's just it's, that's what happened you know what can you do <laughs> okay but in 1981 which is uh, you know many years later 50 years sudarshan and mishra discussed this again and they gave this effect the name quantum zeno effect and uh, then this for the first time they emphasized the fact that this may actually be a measurable effect and they argued that suppose there is a mu meson which uh, is an unstable particle it, it has a finite lifetime so it goes in vacuum then it has some lifetime which you can measure but it also goes through some bubble chamber then in bubble chamber it collides with other things and it ionizes and you know its path is visible then they said that in some sense then whenever it collides with something or ionizes something then it is leaving behind a trace and that is like a measurement so a muon going through a bubble chamber will have a higher lifetime than one in vacuum okay and then they said maybe this is measurable you can a kind of try to estimate how much is this effect which kind of very tiny maybe certainly much less than one percent so it was not detectable but at least in principle it was a measurable phenomena it was not just a theoretical strange idea okay so quantum you know effect has been measured subsequently in many experiments okay and now in fact there is also something called inverse zeno effect where you do some kind of measurement and then you can speed up the transition to other states the system is more likely to change to something else if you watch it than if you don't watch it again it is not a great surprise because you know the process of measuring or detecting what is there inside actually affects it um, somewhat and if you measure it many times then it affects it much more and so you know the inverse you know effect has been experimentally not yet i think um, reliably measured sometimes people claim something but i think it is not very well measured but it is uh, quite reasonable it is not a great surprise if you can design some system such that if you keep on taking an system and you perturb it many times then it can affect it can uh, decay faster okay so here is the proof of the quantum zeno effect and i hope all of you will be able to follow the argument uh, including people who have not seen the schrodinger equation before <laughs> so the time evolution in a quantum mechanical system is given by i h cross d psi by d t equal to h psi so you know if you have seen this equation then it is to help you understand the argument if you have not seen this equation you can skip this equation it implies that for since there is some kind of equation which determines the evolution if you ask what is the state of the system which is the wave function at time small time delta it will be differing from the wave function at time t equal to zero by a small amount and this small amount decreases as delta decreases because you know it grows in the difference increases slowly it's the first order differential equation so the change in delta psi is proportional to delta okay but now comes the point about quantum mechanics he said the probability of detecting the change is actually more proportional to the modular square of the amplitude so the amplitude to be in an orthogonal state psi prime at time delta is proportional to delta and the probability of transition from psi to psi prime which is an orthogonal state is proportional to delta squared and this will decrease to zero as delta goes to zero but faster than linear okay so the probability of being in the same state up to time delta is like one minus some small constant times delta squared for small delta and then if you do this many times like up to time t i'm measuring by amount delta then i make t by delta different measurements then the total probability is this t by delta th power of this small in this quantity one minus a delta squared one minus a delta squared is very near one 
delta is very near zero t by delta is very near infinity so this is one to the power infinity kind of function but you know it's not a very big deal of exercise in uh, limits to check that this actually tends to one as delta tends to zero or if you don't like the formal argument you can put delta equal to one part in a million and see how much it is then put one part in 10 to the power minus 8 and you will check that it will become actually closer to 1. So in the limit when delta goes to 0, this tends to 1. That is the argument. Okay. So now for quantum computation, it is very important that, you know, you have some system in some state, maybe then when you are not doing anything, the state should not change. Like there is some kind, some stuff like memory, quantum memory. So you have stored some data in some place. And then when you want to retrieve it, it should be retrievable. Until then, it should not change. So the system should remain in the same state until you want to change it. But, you know, there is sort of noise in quantum systems and there is very susceptible to noise, external noise. So even when you don't want to change it, the state of the system may change a little bit due to noise. And this we don't like to happen. So we want to preserve quantum states, some, you know, due, be, between computation. During computation, you like to change it. But between steps of computation, you will like to keep, or, you know, some parts you are working with and the other parts should not change. So we would like to find a way to suppress these um, transitions, you know, the, the noise should not cause change. So how to suppress these? So the first idea people had was that if you want to suppress the signals, you can use the Zeno effect, quantum Zeno effect. So even when you are not doing anything, just keep on measuring it and then it will not change. Then when you want to change it, then you change it the way you want to change it. Okay, so this was the idea. But, uh, you know, this is a very expensive and difficult thing. Keep on measuring because measuring is very expensive. It costs a lot of money and costs a lot of time and effort. And, uh, you know, so can we do without this? The answer was that, yes, you can do without it. And uh, you have to understand now what is a measurement? What does it do? So what we do in the measurement is we take a system and Mm, it evolves for some time and then I make a measurement and then it evolves for some time I make a measurement. The measurements are actually not instantaneous. So what I do is I let it evolve for a time, then I couple it to a measuring apparatus and you know together there is some coupling between them which makes the needle in the measuring apparatus change and then I decouple them and then the system evolves by itself and then I measure it again. So in the process of measuring, what I'm doing is I'm subjecting the system to a perturbation which is periodic. We, I couple it to measuring, measuring apparatus, de remove the coupling, then couple it again, remove the coupling, couple again, remove the coupling. So they said that if you can sort of, sometimes what you can do is you can just subject the system to periodic signal. And that will also decrease the probability of transition without making a measurement. The difference between uh, coupling to the measuring apparatus and making a measurement is that if you couple to the apparatus but don't look at what the apparatus does, then in quantum mechanics, it is still not a measurement. Okay. So yeah, actually the issues dealing with this are rather subtle issues dealing with the fact that the measurement is not really an instantaneous measurement and so on. And people worry about all these effects, but let's not worry about them right now. And what we will do is we will just make this statement that it turns out that if you can subject the system to a sequence of inverting pulses without measurement, that also suppresses the transition. So I should now tell you what is an inverting pulse. So inverting pulse looks something like this. This is time. The, in the y-axis, I'm showing a magnetic field. So there is some spin, which is my two-state qubit. And I subject it to a magnetic field. I increase the field for a while and then make it zero and increase it for a while and make it zero. So these are pulses. 
and I can tune the strength of the field and the width of this pulse and the spacing as I wish. So each each episode of this um, blip is called one pulse. Okay, and I will adjust um, the strength of the pulse. Then, if in the beginning if there is a state up or qubit is in one particular state, then after the pulse it will be in the same state, but it will have a phase added. But if it is in the down state, then <clears throat> then the energy of the system is different and it picks up a phase, but it is a different phase. We can choose the convention so that it is plus i phi, exponential i phi is the uh, phase added, sorry, phi is the phase added in the plus state and minus phi is the phase added in the down state. And uh, a convenient choice for phi is pi by 2. Then relative phase between up and down qubit states becomes minus 1. OK, so if you can arrange the field so that the in time integral of the field, which is the, mm, related to the net phase, is such that after the pulse, if initially the phase between mm, up and down states was mm, something, then, then after this, it will be changed by pi more. The down spin uh, picks up an extra phase, phase pi. That is the point definition of the inverting pulse. Okay, so now I want to show how the using an inverting pulse you can preserve quantum states. Okay, so here is a system which is at time zero. It is in a state psi zero, and I'm going to measure it at some time t here. But in between, at half time between the measurement and the preparation of the system, I subject the system to an inverting pulse. So the inverting pulse occurs at this time, and there are two, the system evolves up to time delta, then there is an inverting pulse, then it evolves up to some time delta again, and I make the measurement. So suppose I start with state size zero. Size zero can be up or down. There are two qubit states, but it is starting with some state size zero. Then it goes up to some time delta. At this inverse impulse time, it may still be in the up state or it may be in the down state because there is in between. Okay. And then it goes further, but this in between state may be up or down. And the quantum mechanical principle is that the amplitude to go from size zero to the final state, you should sum over all possible paths in between. So the paths are that it was up and then after some time it was up and then it became down or it was up and then it became down and it remained down. So these are the I'm adding. Size zero is up and psi one is down. Amplitude that psi zero here goes to psi one down here is sum of two terms. One is psi zero goes to psi zero here, and then there is an inverting pulse, and then it goes to psi one in the next half period. Or psi zero goes to psi one in the first half period, and then there is an inverting pulse, and it remains in the psi one in the next half period. It's not the, OK, so this is, so now let me write down these amplitudes. So we go to the left in quantum mechanics, because that is um, just a convention, but it's convenient. So from psi zero goes to psi zero, that is, delta is assumed to be small. So it's nearly one. When it is in the up state, then the inverting pulse doesn't do anything. So that is also that factor is also one. And then there is a factor which is the probability of flipping, which amplitude of flipping, which is small and it is proportional to delta and it is minus i delta times some number alpha. Now let us look at the second term, which is that it flips first. So psi zero goes to psi one, the amplitude is minus i delta alpha, which is same as in the other case. But now when it's at the inverting pulse time, it is down. So there is a phase of minus one. And then minus one, further evolution remains minus one, that amplitude is nearly one. And so this is our answer to the lowest order in delta. And as you can see, this minus i delta alpha is the same in both. But the second term has a factor minus 1, which is picked up because of the inverting pulse. 
and they add up to zero to order delta. So what we have managed to do is we have managed to get a destructive interference between the two amplitudes. Psi zero goes to psi one, either from the uh, in between it was plus size plus uh, it was size zero or it became minus and these two paths pick up a relative phase minus one and uh, so then they cancel to, to lowest order the amplitude from size zero goes to psi one is zero so the uh, amplitude will be of order delta squared not of all delta but the amplitude is of order delta squared then the probability is order delta four Okay, so that is the suppression. Now it turns out that you can try to iterate this procedure. In, so if I can do this, you know, fr from psi zero, I can go to some time and then order delta squared. And there is an amplitude to go to some other state, order delta squared. Then I can apply the same process again, uh, use another inverting pulse and decrease this again, the further destructive interference to make it less. And so people ask that, what if we allow more pulses to be used, then can we suppress better? And this is what come, brings me to the next um, point, which is this um, sequence of inverting pulses. And so I will imagine that I start with a state psi zero, then I evolve for time delta one and in, put an inverting pulse then time delta 2, put an inverting pulse, time delta 3, inverting pulse. I go up to some n steps, put in some n pulses, and afterwards I measure at the end of this. Okay, so now I want to ask, what is the amplitude that there will be no change, or say, or they will, what is the amplitude, there is a change, psi 0 goes to an orthogonal state, psi prime. So now, what we have to do is, we have to ask, what is the amplitude here, and then at the next stage, at the next stage. And this becomes a product of two by two matrices. If you know what is the evolution del in time delta one, then you, there is a unitary two by two matrix corresponding to this. Inverting pulse is a simple matrix, which is one minus one in the standard basis. And then delta two, delta three like that. So you can write the formal expression, which I will not write here. And, uh, sorry. Yeah, so now this, uh, so this amplitude, I would like to expand, in, all the delta i are small. So I can try to expand this in powers of delta i. So in trying to expand this, what I have to do is I have to expand all these u's in powers of delta. So there'll be some delta, delta squared, delta cubed, all these kinds of terms and expand the whole thing and collect the terms. So this is what the collection does. P1 is a polynomial in terms which are linear in delta. So it's a polynomial order one in delta and there is some amplitude there with some coefficient of all these deltas. Then to second order, there is some coefficient again. There are terms like delta squared, delta one squared, delta two squared, delta three squared. And there are terms like delta one, delta two, delta one, delta three, and those kinds of stuff. And so there are different polynomials and there are some coefficients which depend on the matrix elements, which we didn't write down. And then there'll be third order coefficients like this. Okay. And of course, fourth order, fifth order, if you can go up to there. So here, the key point is that the amplitude can be broken into an expansion in which the terms are polynomials in delta i. And we look at order by order. And in the lowest case, I may want to make some of these low order polynomials equal to zero. I want to make P1, P2, Q2, P3, Q3 equal to zero. If I can make all the terms to order 3 equal to 0, then the amplitude will only be proportional to delta to the power 4, right? So this is what I would like to do to whatever order I can do. And, uh, you know, so what, what, what freedom do I have to do this? Well, I have to adjust these delta 1, delta 2. These are numbers I can choose. And if I choose them right, then I can get these coefficients to vanish. This is the hope. 
So it, just to be sure that we understand, P1 is actually equal to, you can work out, and I'm just telling you, is delta 1 minus delta 2 plus delta 3 minus delta 4 plus delta 5 minus delta 6. So that, in this case, will be 0 if you make some good choice of delta 1, delta 2. But I still have some freedom to choose this, so I can try to also make P2 and Q2 0. And how far can I go? This is the question. Okay. So now, if you go to order n, then there are many different polynomials of order n you encounter because they come with different matrix elements of h which come in this expansion. And so, uh, since I don't know what these uh, matrix elements are, then you would like this process to work for all of them. You have to separately set these coefficients equal to zero. And so there are, it turns out, it is easy calculation, but I'm not doing it here, to show that if you want to set all the terms to order n in delta equal to zero, then you get two to the power n minus one equations. Okay. So n is the order of the equations I want to set equal to zero. But, uh, you know, maybe I can, if I want to set these n terms to zero, maybe I can use, I want to get up to cubic order cancellation. Uh, if I use enough deltas, 15 of those, 15 pulses, then maybe I can get cancellation to order three. If I want to use cancellation to order four, maybe you need many more. So if you have two to the power n minus one equations, normally you expect that you should have two to the power n minus one variables, then you can try to solve them together. And it turns out that this is, uh, sorry, it turns out that all these equations which are two to the power n minus one in number can be solved by using only n variables. So this is an over-determined set of equations. You know, so if you have an equation x minus y equal to 5, 2x minus 2y equal to 10. These are two different equations, but they are actually the same equation. Or the equations can be three of them and they can be consistent. So it turns out that these two to the power n minus 1 equations are consistent and there is a solution possible. And it occurs with only n variables, you can solve all these two to the power n minus 1 equations. Okay, so this is a miraculous result. It was first proved by Urig. You can just look up Urig in the internet and you will get the full reference. I'm not going to do it here. And But the proof given by Urig depends on a specific choice of the evolution operator H. Okay, but it turns out that the answer doesn't depend on H at all. And so the proof should not use the particular H either. Okay. So, unfortunately, that has still not happened. So, all the proofs which are available of this result so far, they use some structure of the Hamiltonian in some way. And it seems to be not the best thing because, you know, you don't want to, to prove a, the result doesn't depend on H, then H should not show up. And it seems like a very simple algebra problem in... Um, polynomial equations, just that, you know, so low order algebra problem, high school level algebra, if you like. Maybe, you know, eventually people need higher order mathematics, but at least the statement of the problem does not really need very high order mathematics. Okay, so the, that's an interesting problem. I encountered this because, you know, uh, we were working with Love Grover and we try to get this thing to cancel to fifth order in delta. So there were 31 equations. And to our great surprise, we could solve them using five variables using Mathematica. Because, you know, the equations are fifth order polynomials and they are non-trivial. But uh, we couldn't do to sixth order because um, the Mathematica doesn't work. It is too slow. But uh, the proof by Uric works to all orders in N. And it has been simplified, and this Young and Liu paper gives you some details. And then you can look at something else. So, but I feel that the best possible result of this is not yet there. And, you know, it is a nice and interesting exercise. I will not be able to do much more now, because I think I should leave some time for some questions. Okay, so I will stop here.
Yes, sir, there is a question in the chat. Yes. The question is, do we have an approximation of how small the time between two measurements should be for the Zeno effect to hold? Is there a gradual change as we keep on reducing the time? OK, so the point is this. Of course, it depends on the, uh, the dual variable to the time is the energy. So whatever is the energy scale in the problem, and the inverse of that gives you the time scale. If you have two spins, which are, and there is some coupling between them, which is, you know, you express the coupling in terms of energy. The inverse of that energy is the frequency. And the phase between two different systems changes by 2 pi if the energy difference is um, substantial. Right? So the inverse of the typical energy scale gives you the typical time scale. If if you work with much smaller than this typical scale, then the Zeno effect is visible. A very important consequence of all this is, you know, all of you have studied the radioactive decay of atoms. But actually, by the Zeno effect, if you observe the system, then it will not decay like this. So, you know, what is the time scale at which you should observe one after another? So the typical energy scale in radioactive decay is MeV. So if you make measurements at the rate which is 10 to the power minus 23 seconds, then something will happen. But you know, these kinds of time scales are not easily available. In quantum computation, the scales can be some because of the lower energy scales involved, they can be microseconds, tens of microseconds. So th that is where these things are useful. Uh, okay. Uh, sir, uh, I have a question. Uh, so, yes. at the start of the you have mentioned something that uh, this kind of effects, uh, quantum genetics, is like uh, some some sort of verification, experimental verification is there, right? Uh, hmm? in, in the muon and so I'm just yes. uh, curious about the thing. Uh, the regular systems we study, uh, say yes. uh, we study the uh, uh, photo response of some uh, material and all. Uh, mm. So in, in in those cases, uh, will this you know effect uh, make any difference between the measurement? Because because like in that uh, that case also, we we uh, determine kind of stability of some states uh, and the excitations and. Uh, there should be a like fun, uh, decay time related to it. So if we make the measurement, uh, will the decay time will yeah. be uh, by the measurement and all like or or there is a limitation of the time scale uh, of the like uh, system uh, that uh, depending on which the Zeno effect will work or not work. Uh, can you say? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the kind of experiments over which this Zeno effect has been experimentally checked are cases where <coughs> sorry, an atom has two or three states which are metastable with lifetimes of the order of um, microseconds instead of nanosecond. So then if you put some atom in a metastable state and apply some lasers, then you can see that the, you know it stays in the same state a little bit longer than otherwise. But these times, as of now, the kind of measurement people can do, they can only measure at the time scale of microseconds, not much more. And if things evolve much faster than this, then these effects are not measurable. OK. So in particular, it, the Zeno effect has not been used in actual quantum computers yet. But the overall idea that if you subject system to periodic pulses, then things will work better is being uh, it's kind of established and um, okay that's what i would say no like uh, so it's, it's kind of clear now uh, my whole point of this question is that uh, so in some cases mm -hmm. need actually that 
uh, we need a system to be stable, right? Uh, in in some uh, physical system, we want some states to be stabilized, and uh, we want them to stay longer, uh, as as in case of quantum computing, yes. we also see. So, if yes. there is some way to uh, probe that using this effect, then we can have those kind of systems, and we can actually manipulate those kind of systems as we want. Uh, that we say we want to yes. see a system stable for this time. So, uh, so this that. Yeah. Have like has it been tried in some condensed matter systems and all that uh, making say laser systems also? If we uh, try yeah. to make laser and uh, try to make some metastable state stable for say a particular amount of time, so are there a, like experimental verification of that sort or like? Yeah, 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 yeah. So with. Uh, these um, cold atoms, since uh, you know met metastable states of optically forbidden transitions or whatever, where the you know the systems are in a state which is metastable, but time scales are of the order of microseconds, then you can actually manipulate them in the sense that there is also another version of this whole general idea, which is that you want to make a steer a system from state A to state B quantum control. How much can I control so that I start in state A, but after some time it is in state B, with probability as near one as possible. So those okay. kinds of things are also possible, but uh, typically they require a um, lot of, you know, they are possibly done only in very specific systems with good properties, you know, they should be manipulable, you should be able to handle them, there should may not be too much noise from outside and all these kinds of stuff. Yeah. And so right now this is possible shown in a few cases, but only in sort of very simple one or two systems, not every, it's not a very generic, in principle it is generic, but in practice it requires a mm, lot of technology to be able to get to yeah. those kinds of time scales and resolutions and things like this. Okay. There is a question in the chat. Uh, does the super Zeno effect persist in the many worlds interpretation like the normal mm -hmm. Zeno effect is shown to be? Hmm. Yeah, so this many world interpretation is a very tricky stuff. I, I honestly don't understand it full well. The number of worlds which happen kind of boggles the mind very quickly. What people say, uh, I don't understand this very well, but let me give you my take on it anyway. So it says that the predictions of the many world interpretation are never different from the standard interpretation. So in which case I don't see the point of, you know, all this philosophy about many worlds. Okay. I, I have not found any example where people have said that the many worlds interpretation gives experimentally testable different predictions than the standard quantum mechanics. In which case, you know, I, I feel that many worlds is the same thing with more words. To the degree that the many world interpretation does not have a different testable predictions, it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. not. Sir, uh, actually what I mean by uh, many worlds interpretation is that uh, uh, when you define a measurement, hmm. in, in the definition itself, you separate a quantum system to the classical system. But reality is not like that. No? Reality is all yes. quantum. Yes. So yes. if you if yes. you if you just uh, take that uh, take uh, this truth to be true, like mm -hmm. that everything is quantum, then uh, mm -hmm. the manifest interpretation is like very logical as compared to the Copenhagen interpretation, which says that when you observe something, uh, when a classical system observes a quantum system, there's a like collapse of a wave function. So like it's not yes. uh, really yes. philosophical in the sense that it is actually if we just start from the Schrodinger equation and uh, don't take any assumptions, like it is a natural yes. 
way of seeing things like the observers mm. observers are also a quantum uh, system so like yes there is a system in which you observe the cat to be dead and you the cat is dead and you observe it to be dead and there is another system in which the cat is alive and you observe it to be alive and yes. these like these are two different worlds which are like perpendicular or normal to each other yes okay so no so up to this level i think i would agree you can think you can include the measuring apparatus as part of the measuring apparatus can also be quantum mechanical okay no, it so that is will, that we accept okay in fact the instantaneous measurement postulate is uh, sort of of course it was copenhagen but people realize that it is not really possible or true and it is only an approximation and idealization and one can do standard quantum mechanics without the measurement postulate this is sort of a uh, position which is now kind of accepted maybe not by everybody but the philosophers of quantum mechanics uh, agree that copenhagen interpretation need not be taken can be dropped from the textbooks of quantum mechanics and the measurement process should not be restricted to be instantaneous measurement but then do i have to go all the way to my many worlds or the many worlds convey much more than the fact that any state is a superposition of many possible states uh okay so okay uh i had a similar not sim uh, something on the line of what uh, measurement is um so uh st stand in standard uh what how we define measurement was a uh, you you take a quantum system and mm. then you um, you take a known system and you couple it to the quantum system and since mm. you know how the known system behaves with now the new coupled system you can sort of figure out you can sort of use the new known you can sort of use the known system as a proxy to measure our quantum system right okay this is known is now it is a quantum mechanical system the measuring device is also a quantum mechanical yeah, exactly. system so what so is meant by known mean, it is in it, possible states and so these states I mean, are coupled with the other states and there is a joint hamiltonian yeah so i'm not sure true. that you know you are using this word known states yeah, so the, the reason known i was is, using known was so it's also quantum mechanical you know the other part as well you know, as mm, badly that that was that was exactly my question uh the okay. point is that uh the point that i was going for is that in like a, mm. in uh, in a few texts that i have read and that mm. uh, the this a uh, one human idea of measurement was you basically mm. have something that you know uh something that is prob mm. i don't know if i can say that it's it's classically known or it's something like that what uh, what the conversation is going on right now but uh, what i'm trying to allude mm -hmm. to is here is that um, if you have a quantum system you need to know to, mm -hmm. to do a measurement it seems like you need to know you need a proxy to find you need a proxy to like measure it right but how do you so how yeah. do you this just keeps going on and on right because because the measuring the thing you will measure with is also quantum mechanical so you will then ask okay how do you measure yeah. that and then you'll again go into this thing okay i have this proxy and then you'll keep going again and again so where do you stop and it, like that's also like a like it will just keep going on right am i being you know, okay so the it's sort of you see it, it's sort of it's a question of how do we understand something and the way people understand it now is sort of imagine that uh, there is some instru instrument which is a small measuring device and yeah. there is an observer outside okay so the observer outside you will still take to be you which is sort of classical and thinking and all kinds of stuff but the measuring device is just a small mechanical stuff with 100 atoms let us say then what the 100 atoms can still shift from one position to another and go into a different conformation which will tell whether this is a gene a or gene b or some such thing that is a kind of measurement you see there is some kind of a funny protein molecule and you expose it to some other molecule and then you look at the conformation of this protein molecule if it has changed then it is one gene and if it has not changed it is a different um, object right that is a measurement of some sort 
And so we think of simplified problem like this. You know, you can generalize this a little bit, but it doesn't matter. If you understand this much, then the rest is equally clear. So there is, at the end of the day, there is there is an approximation involving something being uh, something behaving like uh, a classical object or something. Is there? See, the point is this: I cannot imagine the wave function of the universe. There is no such thing. Right. So some decomposition of the system into something which we are bothered about and something which we are not bothered about or we cannot worry about tomorrow, today has to be made. Right. So this is just in the spirit. If you keep on saying nah, nah, you, this is part of this bigger thing, that's part of this bigger thing, then we cannot discuss. All right, all so right. we make a breakup at some stage and saying that this is a subsystem in which we are studying and the rest we will not talk about to today, Perfect. then some discussion is possible. Otherwise, it just gets into ontological mess. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I, I, I really uh, like, uh, so, so uh, what I was thinking, the, the, how we do the measurement is essentially key, you have a quantum system. And uh, you have another mm -hmm. like uh, you you can prepare a, a known quantum system right uh, in some known initial mm -hmm. and then you couple them to yeah. some indirect measurements so uh, you do the coupling yes. in between them and then you then you yes. you then you see what the final state of that uh, the probe is essentially uh, if I say it. yes then I, yes. I can infer something about my system so that is how the yes. uh, this is the correct understanding of the measurement right i mean yes of course so, mm. so i i that is correct yeah so i didn't get what uh, sugat was asking actually ki why he was saying that uh, you know the measurement so uh, uh, so i was referring to uh, something that i had read where they mm. what they do is that they take this uh, proxy particle and then they couple it quantum mechanically only in the hamiltonian so what they do is that for example say you have some system m right and so you bring in this particle and then you introduce a coupling term, which is like just like lambda MP, where M is the systems, ham systems, ham systems part and P is the particle part that I'm using as proxy. And since and the argument was since we know how P behaves quantum mechanically and everything, mm. and we can sort of if 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 so say we do say on this coupled system, we do some experiments and we find out some results. The argument uh, given, uh, I'm not sure if I understood it correctly, but of course I'll try to re uh, say what I understood. Uh, the argument given was um, using uh, using the uh, spectrum of the spectrum of the things that we have found of the couple system, and no and knowing what you know about the pointer system, you can sort of say uh, what is the spectrum of your M, like of your system, and this. Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure if I'm being clear, but I can give you a reference. It's there in uh, Preskill's notes. Okay. I'm, not, I'm sorry if I'm not being clear. Let me interrupt you and give you a simple example of a measurement. So I have a system and I want to measure its temperature. So what I do is I take a thermometer mm -hmm. and dip it into the um, solution, if you like, and keep it for um, one minute and take it out and measure the length of the mercury column hmm. and that tells me what is the temperature of this stuff right in some other case if i want to measure the temperature the voltage at one point i take the multimeter and put the probe point on it and see where the needle goes and the needle position tells me the measurement right now you can make this um, multimeter very small and then see what is the corresponding result and you know you can have a wave function of the multimeter and all this stuff in any case in the end there is a measurement you make on the measuring apparatus yeah to look at the mercury column right now we will not worry about how this measurement is made how your eyes are made and so on you know we are separating the problem into two parts manageable so I have separated the problem of temperature measurement into measuring the height column of the mercury, but I don't tell you how to measure the height column of the mercury. This kind of separation is necessary, yeah. even for quantum mechanics. Yeah, okay? that, that, was, that was exactly what I was asking. Yeah. 
so uh, okay. there, there is a line that we have to draw thank you yeah i, I think it is just uh, for our mm, for any discussion to be possible some such line has to be made Uh, and other other question. Okay. Uh, so so the the treatment uh, like uh, so I I was reading Brower's book. So treatment uh, uh, it gave to this uh, entire Zeno paradox uh, like Zeno mm -hmm. yeah, was was uh, was like with uh, with say open op so by say master equation and all the, that mm -hmm. you you have a, a coupling so to an external system and then you you write. So the conclusion there was that there is, there exists only one ideal limit where where mm -hmm. quantum Zeno limit exists. Like the state is locked in some kind of initial mm -hmm. state or or some project yeah. state. But otherwise, it will go to the steady state of that master equation. Uh, uh, so if you if you look yeah. at the dynamics uh, of I don't know all these master equation stuff. Certainly, maybe the limit one is not reached all the time with finite delta, uh -huh. but. All we are saying is that the transitions are suppressed. Uh, yeah. The, uh, that doesn't depend on the limit. You know, the question about Zeno effect is not just the limit of delta goes to zero. It says that even at finite delta, there will be some effect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Effect will be there. But uh, it won't be possible to locate for, say, arbitrary amount of time. Uh, with uh, uh, I think uh, without being that ideal. Is an experimental limitation, you know. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. There are no clocks that I know which can measure time smaller than ten to the power minus twenty three seconds. Mm. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I had a question hmm. so, uh, about the Zeno effect. So when we are continuously measuring the state, is there any advantage of uh, manipulating the measurement operator? Hmm. So, so I was thinking something along the lines of uh, what is called uh, adiabatic uh, state preparation. I had read a bit about that. So, so certainly, when you make a measurement, you should decide what is the measuring apparatus, how you are going to measure it and all this. So, you know, if I have a thermometer, then I can use it to measure temperature. But I cannot use it to measure the length of the system or some such thing. Right. So or you can take the temperature measurement, but it, some things will have some good accuracy, some things will have less accuracy and all these kind of stuff. So I think that is part of the protocol of measurement. The measuring, uh, the measure properties of the measurement apparatus are part of the protocol of measurement. You can have a different apparatus which is more sensitive. Then okay, you use that one. Uh, you are allowed to change the measuring apparatus and get a better measurement. That's what you are talking about, no? Uh, so what I was thinking was, I mean, we fix a measuring apparatus initially. Mm -hmm. But we want to have a desired evolution of the state, so we uh, change the apparatus continuously during the experiment. Yeah. And you, uh, with using the Zeno effect, we know that the state would always be in some eigenstate of the measurement operator. No, and so let us understand this. So uh, suppose the measurement is like a spin is up or down. The way I do this is to um, put it in some field. I can make the field time varying, OK? Mm -hmm. And then I can you know, change the direction of the field continuously, and so on and so forth. And then I can evolve the system in different way. But it is, uh, you know, you are having a more controllable system with, you know, it's not as simple as just putting the thermometer and take it out. You are taking the thermometer, going in, making it go round and round the thing, stirring the pot with the thermometer or whatever. If you do such things, you can do better measurement sometimes. Sir, so what actually counts as a measurement? Like, what is the definition of a measurement that you? Uh, it gives me some information about the system. Uh, give the information to a human being or like if there are no human beings the there there are still measurements is that 
Ah, so cats are allowed to have information about the city. No, 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 this is a difficult question again. It is also related to this philosophy of science. Is there a, a sound if there is nobody to listen to the sound made? Right? Uh, I think people say that if there is a measurement made and which is not observed, but there is a record of measurement which can be later observed, then it is a measurement. But if there is no record possible, then it is not a measurement. That is the current position. You know, these are slightly tricky issues and dealing them with simple language is hard. But um, I think in the end, roughly speaking, we know what we are talking about. And maybe we don't know very, very well in all cases. OK? So sometimes there is a thing called weak measurement or inaccurate measurement or some such thing. Then it is not a full-fledged measurement, it's a half measurement, right? So it is not even a yes-no question. It is. It can be a question that you have a little bit of information, but not so much, right? All right. So can't you define it in a way that uh when your measurement apparatus uh, is is uh, what you are measuring and uh, what you are measuring it with are in some way coupled together, then it counts of as course, a measurement. They are coupled. Yeah, that is how the measurement works. Otherwise, if they are not coupled, the measurement would not be effective. No. Right. In order for the measuring apparatus to be able to say something about the system, there has to be a coupling. Okay. So, what is weak measurement then? Uh, weak measurement is actually something in which this, you know, in the standard Copenhagen interpretation, what one says is that the collapse of the wave function. But suppose the system doesn't undergo collapse, then uh, so I take a system and I subject it to make. So it says that the measurement takes a finite amount of time. That is the first thing, and it doesn't occur instantaneously. And there is not a full collapse. It is a only, at best, a partial collapse. Uh, doesn't it has to do something with the coupling which we have? Like with the so, if we are doing an indirect measurement, the coupling between the system and the uh, and the the probe is small. Then yeah. we, we say uh, a weak measurement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is very. These are related issues. Yes, of okay. course. It says if the coupling is weak, then it doesn't lead to full fledged measurement. Yeah. It leads to only partial measurement. Yes, it gives a yeah. partial information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. There is some question in some chat box. I think you had a good point. We can make adiabatic change. Yeah, so adiabatic, let's just call it slow. And that is good enough for me just now. You know, how slow is slow depends on the details of the problem involved. Uh, what exactly is adiabatic change? Not only adiabatic change, which keeps the, uh, can you do, do? I don't know the exact meaning of the word adiabatic in quantum mechanics. It's more analogous to quasi-static. Uh, so if, uh, let's just say it is slow and that is good enough. Replace one word by another, which has equally obscure. And, uh, so, so what, what uh, the, 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 like, what I was thinking about this entire discussion was, okay, is it, is it possible to, you know, drive the system, uh, so like slowly, uh, hmm. uh, using like uh, what he was saying, ki, uh, change the probe repeatedly, and accordingly, the state of the system will change uh, according to what the eigenstate of that measurement device is, and yeah. so is it possible to ch uh, change the system desirably using the uh, a quantum Zeno effect essentially, like doing yeah, the yeah, yeah. So, but with different uh, uh, so, sort of uh, operator. So this, yeah, so I was saying that suppose you take a system in the up state, 
and you want to go to in the z direction you want to change it to a state in the x direction then what you do is you measure it in 15 steps first change from z axis to 5 degree away from the z axis then 5 degree more away and more away and then with a large probability you will end up being in the x direction so that is called steering of the quantum state in general and these kinds of things are possible but you know then the operator is changing every time you are changing in one direction then in another direction then in another direction so if you have a sequence of such different measurement operators then choosing the sequence right you can steer the quantum state into your favorite direction interesting i'll, I'll read about it yeah yeah Any further questions? So uh, I'm assuming the part where it helps with decoherence is the is the fact that we are steering it into a preferred direction, right? Sorry, can you say it again? Uh, uh, how does it? Uh, like, I'm sorry if I missed the part, but. Uh, mm -hmm the way in which uh, it helps against like help keep a uh, uh, wait um, it helps it helps in keeping states coherent right mm -hmm. like, uh, so the way in yeah. which it, i'm just trying to clarify the way in which it does that is by not is it, it's kind of like uh, repeatedly uh, forcing it to be in a similar state rather than letting it just interact with everything right no, so uh, so the way this works um, is that if you have a system in some state and you want it subjected to some noise, which I don't know what it is, hmm. then if I subject it to the inverting pulses periodically, then it you know there will be some interference which will occur and the noise will be less effective. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay, are there other questions? If there are no further questions, uh, we would like to thank Professor Thar for this very interesting talk. Thank you.